Hello, Arndt. Hello. Hello. How are you today? I'm very good. It's it's a great day here, and I'm I'm very excited to to be at your conference. Yeah, thank you. We are very excited as well. Thank you so much for supporting Embedded Fest in online format uh, this year. So uh, today you are going to, to talk about IRM architecture, right? Yes, that, that is correct. So I'm I'm the maintainer for the ARM architecture. Uh, for I'm one of the maintainers for the SOC part of the ARM architecture to be specific. And, and this is um, one of three topics that I'm talking about. Um, so I'm talking about first the work that I do, then work that people in the audience might be working on interacting with me and how they would go about working with me, and then broader outlook about the other architectures. Mm. Yeah, sounds, sounds very interesting. So please, if you're ready, please start your presentation. Yeah, okay. So I will start with an overview of the SOC tree. Um, and just a, a very brief summary of how maintainership works in the Linux kernel. So there is a hierarchy. There's Linus Torvalds who pulls new code through Git from, um, let's say, the middle management, the, ma the platform maintainers like myself and a lot of others. We have something like 15,000 patches that get merged every day, uh, every kernel release, and around 900 or so go through the tree that I co-maintain. Um, in the ARM architecture, we actually have three sets of maintainers. We have the 32-bit core kernel code that is maintained by Russell King. And then we have the 64-bit core kernel code that is maintained by Catalin Marinas and Will Deacon. And then in the middle between those, we have the SOC-specific code, which is not specific to one particular CPU, but is everything that gets added by SOC manufacturers. So there's, there's a split between the directories in, inside of the kernel um, and the part that we maintain is actually the largest, but it's also the least interesting of those. Um, you can see an overview of the different, um, as, uh, the, the different maintainer trees by kernel version. So on the right, you see the, the latest versions. Um, each color is one of the trees. So the, the red one in the middle, that is the SOC tree. Um, this is the one that we maintain. So we're always roughly in the, in the top five by patch volume. Um, and then there's the networking tree and Greg Roy Hartman's uh, driver tree, and then the DRM tree, which is just one subsystem, but it's very big and so on. Um, and then the gray stuff in the in the top, that is all the much smaller subsystems combined that don't, um, that otherwise wouldn't show up here. Um, what do we do as kernel maintainers? We spend a lot of time reviewing patches, um, but since there are so many patches, we can't look at them all in detail. And that means we have to delegate a lot um, so most of the patches, by the time they reach us, they have already been reviewed by a sub-maintainer. Um, but then we still have the right to, to veto anything coming up. Usually the, the stuff that the sub-maintainers sent me, um, that's all great. And I have the easy task of just accepting it. So accepting patches is a lot easier than rejecting patches because if something is so bad that I have to reject it, that means something has gone wrong in the process and then I have to spend a lot of time um, educating people and explaining what went wrong. So we are fortunate that this is not happening as much as it, as it used to or as it may happen in other parts of the kernel. Um, we have the same picture um, looking at the maintainers one level down in the hierarchy. So again, we have a bunch of um, sub-architecture trees that are more or less active. On the top, on the bottom, we have the most active ones. There's the OMAP tree, there's 
IMX, uh, there's the Renesas tree, and so on. And then the further we get to the, to the top, the smaller those trees get. So a lot of trees only have a couple of patches. Occasionally, they might not have one every, every merge window, but you see the same pattern happens there again. Um, so how do we get here? When I started, this was what the ARM tree had historically looked like, starting from the, from the beginning of the Git history in Linux 2.6.12 up to 2.6.39. We saw an exponential growth of the, of the number of lines of code in the ARM architecture and also the number of machines. And the number of lines was actually growing much faster. This was not sustainable. And then we did a lot of things that helped change this. One of the things we adopted was to describe machines using device tree rather than having everything hard coded using C code in the kernel. Um, this was a gigantic rework and it was based on work that had already been done in the PowerPC architecture, but at that point had not been widely adopted in other architectures. Um, even more importantly, we changed the, current, the, the, the way that the kernel on ARM SOCs worked so that instead of building a specific kernel that only works on one type of embedded machines, like you could have a kernel that worked on OMAP from Texas Instruments but would not work on IMX from then Freescale, now, I, now NXP. Um, so we changed that so all systems that have an ARM v6 or v7 kernel could run the same kernel image. Um, and then we have the same thing for the even older ARMv4 and ARMv5 machines. Um, and this is actually still going on. So 10 years later, we're still, we still have five platforms left that um, need their own kernels. But almost everything else, um, you can have just two kernels. You can have one ARMv4 kernel and one ARMv7 kernel. Um, we reworked. Um, some subsystems in the kernel, and we introduced a lot of new subsystems. So this is an overview. All this stuff used to be C code that was specifically written separately for each SOC family. And we now have subsystems that each have their own maintainer, um, and each subsystem has pluggable drivers, so that for each of these, um, when you have a new SOC, you would have to write a driver and these drivers can coexist with drivers for other SOCs in the same kernel. Um, so going back to this slide, so where did we end up stopping this exponential code growth that, that was really um, getting in the way? Um, the code, as you can see in the red line, has continuously gone down and still going down um, after the introduction of the device trees. And then um, the the number of machines, which you can see in 64-bit, the, the green line here, and for 32-bit, the yellow lines, this is still growing exponentially. The 32-bit machines have actually, they, they are growing more slowly these days, but 64-bit are catching up. Um, and then we have pretty much just a linear growth of the, the number of lines in those device tree files. So the, the goal of stopping the uh, the growth of code, we have pretty much achieved that, but now we have an enormous amount of device tree files to support all those embedded machines um, that then can run out of the box. Looking at the number of machines actually across architectures, I updated these numbers yesterday, and we now have over uh, 1,600 device tree files in the 32-bit kernel and over 550 device tree files in the 64-bit ARM architecture. And this is way, way more than anything we ever had for board files or for machines in any other architecture or all the other architectures combined. Um, so most of the architectures um, are not used as much. So these numbers are actually going down. Um, for MIPS, there's still conversion of board files to device tree files. Actually, that's still going on for ARM 32-bit as well. Um, pretty much all the other ones are declining. RISC-V is, of course, one that is 
fairly new and that is growing, but at a very low level still with only eight files as of the latest kernel today. Um, here's a, an overview of SOC generations. Um, it turns out that you can actually classify almost every SOC that we're working on that we support in the kernel in one of these three categories. So in the old days, the early 2000s, the oldest machines that we support, there was a wide variety of um, CPU families. You had something usually 128 megabytes or less. Typically, you might have 32, 64 megabytes. And you had what is now considered low speed IO. Then there's the, the middle category that was pretty much all ARMv7. So ARMv7 should take over this whole market and we'll we have time to get into how and why this happened. Um, and this is still ongoing. We're still adding a lot more 32-bit machines. We're not growing quite as fast as we used to, but it's still growing. There's still new SOCs being made with 28 nanometer Cortex-A7 and something on the order of half a gigabyte or one gigabyte of RAM. And then, of course, everything that needs more performance um, or that needs to have some, some high-speed I.O. This is all 64-bit, usually ARMv8 at this point. Um, looking exactly at the ARMv7 SOCs, um, this is the, uh, an overview of how the SOC families evolved over time, up, um, looking at the device tree files that we have in the kernel. So these are all machines that are fully supported and the the one thing that sticks out is out of the three generations of ARMv7, we have the oldest ones, the blue ones, that's Cortex-A8. Um, then we have the second generation, Cortex-A5 and A9. And then the third generation, that's the, the ones that introduced um, virtualization. Um, so this is Cortex-A7, A15, and a couple of others. Um, the, Cortex A9 was really the point where everything came together and uh, the, the whole industry moved from having a large variety of architectures to all using ARM Cortex A9 cores. Um, what happened there was that first of all, the technology was right. This was the first time there was um, an out of order multiprocessing ARM core that was competitive or way better than any of the competition. Um, we had the, the software available, um, and not in, in a small part through the work that Linaro was doing. So there was a lot of synergy, a lot of companies moved into ARM, and there was a lot of work being done, which made the software so much better than the others. And then there was a roadmap for the mobile phones that needed faster and faster CPU cores. So you can see that anybody building their own SOC would be able to replace the Cortex-A9 with something newer later. So A9 took over up to um, maybe Linux 4.10 in the scale. But then everything after that turns out that Cortex-A7 is actually the main driver of new machines. And A7 is technically a, a low performance core. But if you do it, if you shrink a 40 nanometer Cortex A9 design into a Cortex A7, you get pretty much the same performance at a lower cost. So all the low end market is now using Cortex A7 almost exclusively. All the other ones are um, not being put into new SOCs. So all the 32 bit embedded Linux, if you're doing anything on small low end embedded Linux, there's a big chance that you're using a Cortex A7. And this is this this looks like it will keep going on for a couple of years. And of course, all the high end um, that was on Cortex A9 back when it was um, the, the state of the art, they moved on to 64-bit. So here's the same chart for 64-bit. What you can see here is that it's pretty much all Cortex A53. This was the first core that got introduced many years ago by now, but it's still the um, the most common one. 
Um, so this is the, the one you would pick on a 28 nanometer design or a 22 nanometer or the higher end cores that are in popular phones. They actually ship in, in lower volumes and they don't make it into as many SOC designs because it's more expensive to design an SOC around a high performance core. So all the embedded Linux, all the stuff that we're seeing in the SOC tree, that is still, um, it tends to be on older processes. It takes a while to get it into the kernel. Um, so all the latest cores, the Cortex A78, that is in that you would find in, in high-end phones, um, that doesn't even show up. And all the custom cores I didn't include because they tend to usually only be in, in one or two SOCs from the company that made a custom core. So these are licensable cores that get put into SOCs by other companies. Um, coming to the next main topic, so supporting a platform um, in the kernel. What do you do if you are a maintainer for, if you work on, on an SOC platform that is not in the mainline kernel yet and you want to get it in? Um, as a background, this is how I view the, the various states of upstream support. So ideally a fully upstream supported machine is a device that can run a mainline kernel. You can run any distro, you can run Debian or whatever you want um, with their kernel and every feature on the design is fully supported. There are drivers for everything and it all just works. At the bottom, you would have a machine that got shipped to a customer in the past, it is still running, but nobody's ever going to update the kernel anymore. And to us in the kernel, these these machines are dead. Um, so we there's no reason to keep support in the kernel anymore if nobody's updating the kernels on hardware. Um, and actually, even the yellow parts, if um, nobody is updating the kernel version anymore and they're just adding bug fixes from the LTS kernels, it is also dead to upstream. And the work that a developer downstream would do, the bring up is the work that you would take to get a machine from the, from the bottom all the way up to the top or however far you can get it. Um, and I like to use the word bring down for this, for the process that happens if you if you stop putting work into it, because this is what happens over time by itself. It just, uh, support, the, the, the level of support can only go down if you don't put work into the bring up. Um, what does it actually take code wise to, to create a new platform? Um, so we usually have between one and three new SOC platforms every kernel release. Um, and each one of these needs a couple of drivers. It needs an interrupt controller driver. It needs um, IO driver, at least a serial console. The timer is usually the same. The IQ chip nowadays is all, always the same. You would have PCI or USB, usually one of the two, sometimes both. If you have these, then you can boot Linux and basically use it. Um, the full platform support le needs a couple of extra drivers. This depends on the specific SLC. So the ones on the left, GPIO, pin control, clock reset, and so on. These are drivers that one would have to write for each SLC, but that can come at its own time, um, depending on the requirements. And then there may be custom drivers that do not have a subsystem. Um, and these are the hard ones. So if the, if the SOC has, has a feature that no other SOC has, um, you not only have to write a driver, you have to write a, um, a user interface, which has a lot of additional requirements. So this is the really, really hard part. Um, and this is also the, the part that gets left out most commonly. So a lot of the machine learning acceleration chips, they do not have upstream drivers. And we're, we're trying to change that, of course, but it's a long process. What are the, the problems that people face? 
for upstreaming their platforms. So GPU drivers used to be the hardest part. Now almost all GPUs that are put into SOCs actually have an open source driver through a long, um, that, that has been a long process of reverse engineering mostly. A couple of companies are now contributing their own GPU code. Um, but we, we only got here through reverse engineering. Android used to be a big problem because it used to require out of tree patches. We've come to the point where it usually works even with an upstream kernel. There's still an Android tree that has additional patches, but you don't require them. Um, some SOCs um, are developed, like the, the time between the first time it runs code and the time it gets sold is so short that there's just no way to get the kernel upstream before the product is out. So that's, that's a problem. Um, and sometimes these are discontinued just as quickly. And then there may be unannounced products that um, where it's impossible to publish the drivers without giving away proprietary information. Um, and then subsystem abstractions, I mentioned that for uh, something completely new, you might not have a user interface or even worse, there might be competing user interfaces and you need to pick one or push the one that you want into the mainline kernel fighting against the ones that um, have a competing subsystem. Okay, and now for the, for the third part of my talk, looking at the even broader world um, across CPU architectures, what, what is there beyond ARM or what was there in some cases. Um, this is a graph that I made just to look at the rate of change that is going into each platform, each, each CPU architecture. So you can see that like when I started working on this, everything was 32-bit ARM. This was by far the, the fastest changing CPU architecture, but by now it's only number three. You can see the, the, the blue line for ARM32 has been taken over by the red line for 64-bit ARM as well as x86, which does not include the device tree um, files. So this is all code changes, while for ARM, it is mostly device tree files. Um, there's also PowerPC as the, the usual number four. There used to be a strong MIPS um, architecture, but this has faded away over the last few years. And S390 is the, the only other one that is constantly there, but is not being changed at the rate as the other ones. Um, so risk five doesn't doesn't even really show up. I'm zooming in for the for the other ones. You can see that risk five as the up and coming architecture, of course, is um, slowly uh, sticking out here, but it's still at a very low volume, something between fifty and seventy patches per release recently. And all the other architectures really don't show up when you look at the the rate of change. Um, this is what the world what, like if I, if I imagine the CPU architectures as a world map, um, what it looked like 10 years ago. So there were a lot of architectures that were equally important at the time. So the size in this graph, um, you would have ARM um, and on, on the left and MIPS in the middle, PowerPC more at the high end in data center, all the, all the big important stuff was big Endian at the time. Uh, the little Endian stuff was always being considered not as professional. So the, I have little Endian on the left, big Endian on the right. Uh, and then you have minor architectures, the small dots here. Um, we removed a bunch of architectures. That's something I worked on identifying the ones that haven't actually been used for a while. Um, so we removed architectures that all got changed over to ARM around the time the Cortex-A9 was introduced, some earlier, some later. Um, so that cleaned it up a little bit. We had migration of users. So um, a lot of PowerPC and Spark and MIPS, they all moved to ARM and x86. 
Super H as well. So these these all got a lot smaller, uh, while X86 and ARM slowly took over the, the entire world. Um, you can also see this means a migration from big Endian to little Endian platforms. And then we had some architectures that used to have a lot of big Endian users, Power, MIPS, Microblaze, they had um, mostly power, mostly big Endian or equally big Endian, little Endian. They all got um, changed to having mostly little Endian users these days. Um, and then of course we had new architectures come in. So Arc was merged. This is actually an old CPU instruction set, but we only added it in the past 10 years. Then RISC-V was added and slowly getting traction. Um, so this is what it looks like um, around this time. Um, so to summarize my, my talk, we have um, the ARM SOCs that have taken over the world slowly, 64-bit taking over from 32-bit with both still growing, uh, still, still in the growth path, but 64-bit um, growing more quickly these days. Um, we have the SOC platforms that are constantly getting more complex and we have to fight with this in the kernel to um, keep the um, abstractions that we have in the kernel cope with those, introducing new subsystem and so on. Um, and that's it for my talk and I hope you have some interesting questions. Yeah, thank you, Arndt. Thank you for, for your talk. Uh, dear participants, if you have any questions, you can uh, write them down in the chat now. And we have still uh, several minutes to answer them. Uh, if not, you can join the Zoom room uh, with Arndt after this talk, like after five, ten minutes, uh, and uh, ask your questions live uh, and have a live discussion uh, with Arndt. So, yeah. I don't see actually any questions as for now. Yeah, so maybe uh, maybe uh, participants will join the Zoom room. So Arn, thank you once again for, for conducting the talk at Embedded Fest. We appreciate it a lot. And actually hope mm. uh, that maybe next year we can meet in person in Kiev. So we'll, we'll, we will look forward to it. Thank you.